I grew up in, I guess, what would be considered poverty today, because we really had very little money. And, um, and so food was actually a problem. And at the age of 10, which is pretty early actually, I decided that the only way to get out of this situation was to, through education. Now, whatever inspired me to think that as a 10 year old, I'm not sure, but I was a reader. I, we didn't have a lot of toys. We didn't have a lot of, we didn't take vacations. I didn't go anywhere. So I went to the library. That was it. And I must have read something that indicated that education was the way to go. And so I set that as my goal. Uh, that's how I went to work really early. I went to work at 14. And, but I went to work at something that I thought I would enjoy and be good at, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I went to work as a reporter for a local newspaper. Actually, I was the Girl Friday. I had no training whatsoever. And I had the audacity to go in there and ask if they needed a, a helper. I can clearly remember them all just like looking at each other. It was a whole group of guys. And they're like, sure, we need a Girl Friday. <laughs> we'll pay you three cents a word. And it was like, oh, that's a deal. I'll take it. But I, I managed to earn enough money to be able to go to, to college. It was, it, was, it was a challenge. It was stressful. But I was so determined. I had a goal. And my goal was to have a college degree. Why are you so passionate about education? Well, because... First of all, it saved me. It empowered me. I got to do what I wanted to do in life. Um, after that, I traveled. I've done a lot of things. And so my goal is to help other people, other kids, see the power of education. Actually, when I think about education, I think about empowerment. Education is the ticket. It's the key to being empowered because you learn things that can help you lead a better life. Mm. So my goal is to help everybody have this opportunity. I mean, I have hundreds, maybe thousands of very successful students. I mean, really successful. And my theory is that they became successful because they feel empowered. They feel that they can do whatever it is they want to do. And so if they have a setback, some kind of failure, big deal, just do it again, you know, whatever. That's the philosophy of my class. You don't write the story right, well, join the crowd. No one writes it right the first time. So you learn by making mistakes and by doing it repeatedly. And so that's my goal. And, but that transfers to life in general. What is it that um, concretely you do in your classroom that you feel empowers students to later on live more fulfilling and um, productive lives? There's basically four main things. Number one is I teach communication. And in order to be able to produce a publication, students need to be able to communicate. And so I don't interfere. In other words, they have to communicate effectively with each other in order to do that. So communication and these, communication is one very important skill. And these skills last for life. If you know how to communicate well in high school, trust me, you can communicate well in college mm. and in real life. The second thing is collaboration. So you don't want a kid that just does everything on their own. You want to teach kids to work together in teams and you have to work with everybody, whether you like that person or don't like that person. I don't want to hear about the fact that you don't like that person. Okay, you go home and ask your mom and dad how many people they work with that they like. And if they like everybody and love them all, well then, okay, maybe I'll change your group. Otherwise, you have to work with everybody because they're all part of life. They're all going to be there. You think these people are going to disappear? <laughs> they're going to graduate with you. They're there forever. So the second one is collaboration. First communication, then collaboration, then critical thinking. And how do I teach critical thinking? They have to go out and collect information. That's what journalism is. You get primary sources. You find out what's going on in the world, right? You're a news reporter. Or even you're writing an opinion piece. You have to find opinion on both sides. So you collect the information, and then you have to figure out what's most important. Do you know how hard that is for most people? Like you, you collect two pages of data. 
what's most important? That's really hard mm. to figure this out. So if you have practice doing this, you do this every day, every week, you get really good at it. Mm. And that is one of the, that is one of the four. So communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and the fourth one is creativity. Creativity is something you have to practice. So they make a lot of mistakes. That's fine, I don't care, you know, just redo it. Re redo whatever it is. But your creative mistakes, some of them are totally wacky, but it turns out that they were really good ideas. Mm -hmm. So that's how, those are the main things. And these are skills for life. Trick is something that I came up with together with my students, actually. So trick stands for trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. And so the number one thing is trust. I trust my students, sometimes to a fault, mm. but I've never regretted it. I believe that they know what they're doing. If they come late to class, I assume it was for a good reason. Most kids, they want to do well. They want to be accepted. They want to do a good job. That is my philosophy. Mm. They have to be given the freedom to come up with their own ideas and think for themselves. Mm. A moonshot in education is something that is very hard to do, something that is really important for us to do, and something that we all need to accomplish. And it is changing the way we think of education. Mm. Because education today is dramatically different, but the school systems haven't changed. And the reason they haven't changed is because education today is still seen as lecture-based and book-based. People are educated when they're sitting in a classroom, listening to a teacher, taking notes, and then taking a test. That's considered education. They completely disregard the fact that most of us are learning on our phones. The view 100 years ago was, I, the adult, I'm smarter and I'm gonna tell you how to be smart. My view today is those kids are innately very smart. They've been using those electronic devices for a long time. Let's give them an opportunity to be creative and to use the information that they know in creative ways. That doesn't mean I think about getting rid of the, the lecture-based model. My theory is 80% of the curriculum can be lecture-based, the old system, 80%. We just need to change it for 20%, 20% time. Well, why not push it further? Because the system is so entrenched in the way it's been handed down for generations, it's very hard to change it. Mm. And so I wanna work with the system as it is. And if they can first start doing 20% of the time, then, and they see how it works, then they can maybe move to 30%. It can be a gradual shift. Change is very hard for people. Change is very hard for cultures. Change is hard for everybody. We all talk about change, but no one really wants to do it. <laughs> Some of the most dramatic discoveries that have happened in the last 10 years have been kids. Have you seen the Google Science Fair winners? I haven't. Well, I would like to suggest that everybody go online and look for Google Science Fair winners. These are young people who are maybe 13 to 18 who have come up with solutions to worldwide problems. Mm. Just give them some freedom. They can have a computer. They can go and play on Khan Academy. They can program. They can code. They can have a maker space where they build things. Every part of the world has different challenges. The kids can be part of the solution. Give them an opportunity. Mm. And then in that opportunity, they also get to learn more. Mm. It's a blend of the old system and the new system. So you're using technology to support your teaching. 
You know, instead of just lecturing about the Civil War in the United States, for example, you can have kids go online and look up, like, how did the Civil War impact the world today? And they're like, what's the Civil War? I was like, well, maybe you should go online and find out what is a Civil War? And then, like, what's happening today that might have been impacted by the Civil War? I mean, what kinds of things are happening? That's the way to teach history. Mm -hmm. Instead of the way I learned history, you got a book, you had a bunch of dates, you had to memorize the dates. Memorize the dates, memorize people that have no meaning to me, take a test. It was, I was a good memorizer, so I got A's, but I don't remember anything that I remember, you know? I can't remember it. And most people are like the same way. Mm -hmm. They cannot remember it. With blended learning, how do you apply that in your classroom to what you're teaching? Well, so my class is a total blend because I would say my class is 80% of the time students are in charge, in total control. 20% of the time I lecture or one of my colleagues, Rod, he lectures, or we also have uh, writing coaches, maybe they will lecture. But the majority of the time is self-directed learning. Mm kids working in teams with each other and producing publications. They have a deadline every three weeks, and every three weeks they come out with a 24-page, three-section, full-size newspaper. There are about 12 different publications here, and there are about a little over, or between the six and 700 students involved, so about half the student body of Palo Alto High School. They produce a newspaper called the Campanile, um, they produce multiple magazines. One is Verde, it's a news magazine. Another word is Sea Magazine. Sea Magazine is arts and entertainment. Then they have Viking as a sports magazine. Then they have Agora. Agora is foreign affairs magazine. Mm -hmm. Then they have a science magazine that they just started. And now they have a travel magazine that they just started. And then in addition to that, we broadcast every single day to the school. It's archived on the website. So also we have radio 24 seven, if you wanna do radio. Um, you wanna do just a video production, just make movies of your own choice. We have a video production class. Uh, we also do graphic design. Maybe you wanna do some graphic design. Why is collaborative learning so critical, you think, to education? You learn, all the educational research shows that you learn the most out of school. Did you know that? 80% yeah. of the learning takes place out of school. That was research that was done years ago. So my theory was like, gee, if it's all happening out of school, what's happening out of school that's not in school? Mm. Well, the main thing is you're talking to your friends. So, okay, well, you're talking to your friends. Well, how about talking to your friends in school? That'll make sure that you're actually learning. So, <laughs> so there, yes, talk to them. Talking about media literacy, as you were saying earlier, you know, we live in the age of the internet where any information is at, the, at your fingertips, essentially. Of course, as we're seeing now that some of that information is not always reliable, sometimes information is intentionally misleading. In this context, how do you define media literacy? I define media literacy as being able to not only consume information intelligently, but contribute. Be a creator, not just a consumer. And I would like to see every kid in the United States or the world actually have media literacy training mm -hmm. so that they would be able to understand what is a reliable source and what sources should you be suspicious of. I think in the past, you know, 20 years ago, anything that was printed was credible. That's one of the problems. Today we have to say anything that's online is suspicious until proven not otherwise. So if I get information from the New York Times, I'm less likely to be suspicious than I am from some source that I never heard of. And people need to know what are the reliable sources in their country. And um, by teaching this to kids, you are empowering them. Should that be a critical component in any educational curriculum? Everywhere. It should be embedded everywhere. So civics should be taught in all schools. 
everywhere, worldwide. Like, how does your government work? How do you, how do you get elected to office? How does it work? And part of that should be media literacy because media literacy is communication between the government and the people, but it's also today communication between one person and another person. Mm. You need to understand that. You need to understand how Facebook works, how Twitter works, you know, all that. And w right now we're not teaching that. Right. As a matter of fact, we're banning phones in the schools. You can't, so we don't, not only don't teach how to do that, we ban the device. So then after school, the kid goes home and then doesn't know how to use the device intelligently. That's not a smart move. Could journalism be incorporated into the mainstream curriculum of, of, of our schools more? Journalism should be incorporated into the curriculum all schools worldwide. Journalism is part of the 21st century. This is the century of media. To ignore it is like ignoring the advent of the automobile at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, we could have just banned automobiles. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know, there were groups of people that wanted to ban the automobile. Mm -hmm. Too dangerous, they said. Might kill some people. <laughs> so we could also ban phones, right? Too dangerous, upsetting the whole world. But how about, we're never gonna get rid of the problem if we don't teach kids how to use it intelligently, ethically. Should start in kindergarten. You know, when is it appropriate to use your phone? When you go home to dinner and have dinner with mommy and daddy? No, no, that is not the time to use the phone. That's the time to talk to your mom and dad. What does journalism have to learn from education? And what does education have to learn from journalism in your estimation? Well, I would say the main thing that journalism needs to learn from education is how not to do it. Journalism learning from education should, should learn that education is actually, if teaching, learning, doing is actually the key mm -hmm. to having people really understand it and do it. Journalism is at the heart of everything. Journalism is communication. Journalism is, and communication is the key to everything. How we communicate is really the basis of everything. Relationships. That's why we're all here. That's why we learn to talk. Right. We're here in sort of the heart of Silicon Valley. Yes. Um, and we're talking with you, an innovator in educational technology. Um, what areas of educational technology are changing right now? What, what things are happening and changing in that realm? So now they're trying to include more AI. So that means a child is on a computer, they answer some questions on the computer, and then the computer actually can teach them, learns what their mistakes are, and then updates and modifies whatever it is that they are learning mm. and can give them feedback. That's actually very uh, engaging, it's fun. But I think one of the things that we need to be careful about with that is that you can't put kids on computers for hours on the end and expect them to learn. Education still is and always will be interaction between people. The teacher still needs to be involved. The most effective use of computers, I find, is when kids have to collaborate. So two kids on one computer, or maybe they are on individual computers for an hour, but then they have to stop and talk about what they did. If it's not applicable, they will forget it. Along the same line, many parents, myself included, I have an 11 year old and a nine year old, um, are concerned about our children's overexposure to screens and technology. What's, we've been talking about this, but what's your take specifically on that? So I think there is overexposure. And that's because no one has come up with the ideas of how to control, self-control. So what we've done instead is we banned the phone. So parents are like, I can't take it another minute. I'm taking that phone away from you. And they run in, grab the phone, and they're screaming and crying, and then hysteria, and then the next day to give the phone back. <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, so there should be 
basically there should be a certain amount of time that is recommended for kids to be using their phone or whatever. There should be a s selected apps that the parent can pick between. These are things that I would suggest that you work, that you look at or play with. Here now you have an hour, you can pick your own things. You know, so you share the space. They get to pick some, you get to pick some. But then they need to know the rules. They cannot keep playing with their phones all the time. It becomes, it's an addiction. So the question is, how successful was prohibition in the United States? Well, if it wasn't so successful, then banning phones is not a good idea. You know, what, how did we deal with it? We taught people like the negative impact of alcohol. We gave them, you can't have alcohol till you're 21, right? When you do, these are the rules. This is, you know, you drink too much, then you have these problems. I mean, we have to do the same kinds of things with the phone. And, you know, and parents need to stop checking on their kid every five minutes. We want to control our electronics. We don't want the electronics to control us. The preschool education, zero to five, is absolutely critical. And they need to remember that while that person they're taking care of can't speak yet, can't walk yet, can't feed themselves yet, they are still learning and they are learning even faster because they will be given some kind of an electric, electronic device by the age of three, usually, sometimes as early as two. So preschool education is really important. And we should focus on that and give as many kids as possible an opportunity to have social interaction. And if they're using a device, as I said, Maybe they use it for 20 minutes, then they have to play for an hour. They cannot just use it. Just using those devices as babysitting tools is uh, not a good idea. Sorry. Let's give kids some freedom. Let's trust them. Give them some control of what they're learning. Don't tell them what to do all the time. Respect them. You know, respect their intelligence. Swear to God, they're really smart. Even the ones that you don't think are smart, they're smarter than you think. Give them an opportunity to collaborate and to think, and then treat them with kindness. They make a mistake, it's okay. Don't be nasty and hold grudges, you know? Let's treat everybody with kindness. Kids are learning, and they learn from you, by the way. You are the model, you the parent, the teacher, the administrator, you are the model. Just remember that. Mm -hmm.